You know, hospitality can be a really messy thing at times. A wife invited a bunch of people over for dinner, and as she prepared everything, sat everyone down, she asked her little daughter if she would pray a blessing for the meal. And the little daughter says, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what I should say, mommy. And she said, well, you pray back what mommy says. And she goes, okay. She thought about it for a second. She bowed her head and she said, Lord, why did I invite so many people to dinner? <laughs> Can get messy sometimes, hospitality. <laughs> or, or you know, when you, when you invite your preacher to dinner and the preacher comes over to dinner. And so a little boy was sitting at the table and he looks up at the preacher and he said, preacher, when I get older, I'm going to give you some money. And the preacher goes, oh, okay, that's, that's really nice. Why was that? He said, because my dad said you're the poorest preacher he's ever heard. <laughs> okay, so hospitality is often difficult. We got that part, but it is an important part of life, isn't it? Being hospitable people is a good thing. It's, it's messy, I got it. It's messy at times, but it's a good thing. Uh, James Cox said, you and I tend to offer hospitality to only a limited number of people persons whom we already know, mostly relatives, and a few close friends. But in Abraham's time, hospitality was extended to whomever needed it, strangers and acquaintances alike. In fact, in its original form, hospitality combines two separate words. This is in the Greek. One meaning friend and the other meaning stranger. So from the beginning of his usage, hospitality has carried with it the idea of making friends out of strangers. Hospitality. How would you like to host a dinner for God? That's what happens in the text today. God shows up and he's shown hospitality as he's here. In fact, God shows his grace to Sarah in chapter, uh, chapter 18, giving her faith to believe his promises and his mercy as Abraham intercedes for Sodom. See, God is doing some amazing things in this chapter, and we kind of focus on the hospitality, we kind of focus on the discussion of, of God with, with Abraham, but it's really much bigger than that. It's really not about hospitality, and it's really not about Sarah, or even necessarily about Abraham and his discussion with God. It really is an amazing story about how God shows up to give an old woman the faith she needs to conceive the promised son. And to share with his friend Abraham, which we are told in the scriptures, Abraham is called his friend, to share with his friend Abraham what he's going to do in Sodom and Gomorrah, giving Abraham an opportunity to show us his compassionate heart. That's what's going on in this chapter. God is at work in this whole chapter, and we kind of focus on the things that happen, but keep in mind, it's God who shows up to do these things in this chapter. We didn't finish chapter 17. In the last half of chapter 17, basically God changes Sarah's name from Sarai to Sarah, promises again that the son is coming from her. The first time we know it's from her, not just from Abraham. We know that the son is going to be the one who's going to be in covenant with God like Abraham was. Ishmael is not. So he's the promised son to be in covenant. Now we come to chapter, and it hasn't been much time between the end of 17 and chapter 18. Remember, he circumcised at 99 years of age in chapter 17. And now just a short time has taken place before we get to chapter 18 here. Look with me, open up your Bible, turn on your device, whichever the case may be. This is the word of God. We want to look at it together. Verse number one of chapter 18. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of day. So this is siesta time. This is a time that you're normally napping at this time of the day. In the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, in his astonishment, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd. At, this guy's 99 years old. He's moving quickly. He's running here. He's, do, he's 99. And so he runs to, to the herd. And he ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. 
and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. He's watching, he's, he's watching over his guests to make sure that they're taken care of. Hospitality. So he's at the Oaks of Mamre, which really is his home. This is a place that he set, set up an altar. This is a place that he worships God. This is a place that he calls home here. In fact, in chapter 13 of Genesis, we see he came here first. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the Oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. So he has a home. He's residing in his, this is a place that he worships God. He, he brings his family up to love God. This is his home that he's at right here. He looks up and, he, and, and, and what he sees is significant to him. It says, behold. I mean, number one, it's the heat of the day. You're supposed to be sleeping at this time of the day. And these guys just appeared out of nowhere. They just arrived. So he was astonished at what he saw in front of him. We don't know where they came from. They, they, just, they just arrived. There were three of them. We know that two of them are angels. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because at the end of chapter 18, they move off towards Sodom. And verse 19, or chapter 19, verse 1 tells us, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. So two of them were angels. Later on, we find out that the Lord is speaking himself. So this is the Lord that has come to him. The Lord is speaking, verses 9, 13, 20. This is, this is a theophany, a visible manifestation of God. God comes to Abraham. So two angels and the Lord are there and he's making dinner for them. It dawns on him later on as, as the Lord is talking. He knows, he knows that they're important people, but he doesn't know who they are until the Lord starts talking. And then could you imagine where his heart is going? Wow, I hope the food is good. Wow, I hope that the, the cakes are all right. Did we cook the cow? I mean, all these thoughts, you know, you've been, you've, you've, uh, you've given hospitality. You know the thoughts that run through your mind. This is the first place in the Bible where a, a man initiates a conversation with God. So he's initiating the conversation with God. These three visitors, we've never seen anything like a trio of heavenly visitors that have come. So he shows his reverence by bowing to the ground. Again, he doesn't know up front exactly who they are other than they're important people. He finds out later on who they are as, they, as God is talking. So Abraham's actions show the warmth of his welcome. All the things that he did. He went quickly. He ran. He, I mean, 21 quarts of flour and a, and, and a fattened calf. That's more than three people need. That is a royal banquet. Three people don't need that much food. 21 quarts of flour makes a lot of bread. You know, that's a, it's a royal banquet that he's given. Abraham is playing the role of an extraordinary host. He is very generous, more than what his guests could possibly eat. He's giving them. He's showing that he cares. He's, he's exercising hospitality well. And there's a sense of urgency. He requests bread. He requests meat. There's this urgency that's going on. He, he wants to give hospitality to these three. A banquet for royalty is what it was. So Abram stood while his guests ate the meal. He's watching them eat to make sure that they have all of their needs. He washes their feet. He gives them water. Everything that they need, he's taking care of them. Karen Maines distinguishes between hospitality and entertaining. Entertaining says, I want to impress you with my home, my clever decorating, my cooking. Hospitality seeking to minister says, this home is a gift from my master. I use it as, his, as he desires. Hospitality aims to serve. Entertaining puts things before people. As soon as I get the house finished, the living room decorated, my house cleaning done, then I will start inviting people. Hospitality puts people first. No furniture, we'll eat on the floor. The decorating may never get done. You come anyway. The house is a mess, but your friends come home with us. Entertaining subtly declares, this home is mine, an expression of my personality. Look, please, and admire. Hospitality whispers, what is mine is yours. And that's how Abram was. What's mine is yours. I want to make sure all of your needs are met. I want to be hospitable. And that's what he does to these three. Hospitality doesn't play such a big role in our culture today. We're kind of individualistic. Uh, but in that culture, especially in the East, it's very important. You never betrayed your host. You always were kind to your host. And the host was responsible for taking care of the needs of his guests. Played a big role. As a matter of fact, though, there is a warning and an encouragement in the New Testament about hospitality that's linked to this, this event right here. It comes from Hebrews chapter 13. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. That's kind of, 
It's kind of weird, huh? You, you invite a stranger to your home to show hospitality and it turns out to be an angel. That's kind of amazing. So it's a warning and an encouragement. It's a warning is don't neglect hospitality and an encouragement is you may actually entertain an angel someday. So now the scene shifts from the feast to the Lord's announcement. Look at verse number nine. They said to him, so they're speaking to, uh, to, to Abraham. Sarah is inside the tent. Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. The ladies were not participating with this. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, this is important. This is not for Abraham's ears. These words are for Sarah's ears to hear. The Lord knows she's listening. These are words for Sarah that Sarah needs in her life. So she's listening. She's listening at the tent door behind him. So he's in front, behind, he, he's in front, she's behind in the tent. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. Well, we know that. He's 99 years old. She's 90. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Again, he wants Sarah to hear these words. At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. These words are for Sarah's ears. Yeah, he's talking to Abraham, but Sarah needs to hear this for a particular reason. So here the promise of a son was made to Sarah directly for the first time. It's been 24 years since, they, since they've left Ur of the Chaldees, and God has only spoken to Abraham, never to Sarah. She only hears God's voice through her husband, Abraham. He's never directly talked to her. You can imagine how frustrated she would get at times when she doesn't have a word of the Lord. She's hearing it from her husband and she sees nothing happening in her life for 24 years. Now God comes to give her a word so that she will take this word and use it. The visitors know her name. So that tells us something about the visitors. How would you show up at someone's house? How would you know their name? Again, this tells us something about who the visitors are. The Lord discerns her private thoughts. She's thinking in her heart. He knows her heart. And so God addresses Sarah's barrenness that he's going to do something about it. And he tells her directly, this time next year, you're going to have a son. You, Sarah, are going to have a son. So she did doubt. The text says she did doubt. And whenever we doubt God, we are really questioning both his veracity and his ability. Are you really true God? And can you really do that is what we're really asking when we doubt. She did doubt. But from this, something arises from this doubt in the word of the Lord that was given to her. See, she doubts, but God comes to give her the faith to believe his promises. A word from the Lord to believe and to trust. One that she can hold on to where faith can be enlivened in her. So God is calling Sarah to believe the impossible. She's not in a position to have children. She's to believe the He came to give her the faith to believe the writer of Hebrews tells us this. The writer said this, By faith Sarah herself received power to conceive. So she believes the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord that came to her right here, she believes it. Yes, she doubts it at first, but that word worked in her and the faith to believe the promises. Because the writer of Hebrews tells us, By faith Sarah received power to conceive. Even when she was past the age she, since she considered him faithful who had promised. So she doubts at the moment, but then the word of God works on her heart, producing the faith in her to believe the promises. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. So whenever we doubt, whenever we're doubting, we look to the word of God, to the promises of God, and we pray that God gives us the faith to believe those promises I lack faith, God. Give me the faith to believe your word, to trust your promises, to rest in them. And when he makes a promise, we can be sure that he has the power to fulfill it. He is true and he is able. He will remain faithful even when we are faithless. Sarah is in a place where she cannot conceive. She cannot conceive. She's 
postmenopausal. Now, I'm not a doctor, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm guessing that means there are no more eggs in her ovaries to be released. She's postmenopausal. She has no eggs to release. It is an impossible situation for her to get pregnant. It's an impossible situation. Why did God wait so long? God waited purposefully so long. So she was past childbearing age so that he would receive the glory when she conceives and have a son. It's not about Abraham. It's not about Sarah. It's about God who keeps his promises. That's why he waits. You know, that's why he waits sometimes to answer your prayers too. And my prayers. He waits till all of the stuff that we're propping up our lives with are removed so that he alone receives the glory for answering the prayer. So there is a conception of Isaac by natural means. Yes, that was procreation. Abraham comes to Sarah, his wife, and they have sexual intercourse, and it's, it's normal. But again, it's miraculous because she has no more eggs. She's postmenopausal, so it's miraculous. And that's, it's not like Mary, where Mary was con- Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. It's not like that. It's a natural procreation, but it's miraculous in that she had no more eggs. God comes. Conception, let alone birth, was impossible. But Abraham believes the word of God. Paul says in Romans 4, in hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. He believes, and Sarah does too now. She believes. He did laugh in chapter 17. Abraham did laugh at the announcement, but he laughed out of a different motivation. He laughed more like, oh man, this is like, how could this possibly happen? She's going, no, I don't think it could happen. See, there's a difference in the motivation of the laughter. God doesn't rebuke Abraham. He does Sarah here. And Abraham believes. Romans 4, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. He is able and truthful. I mean, you can imagine, Sarah, a lifelong of barrenness. It just, in her mind, it's inconceivable that she could get pregnant. It makes sense when you think of it from her point of view. She's past childbearing age. She's never had a child. She's been barren all of this time. It doesn't seem possible. I mean, we can understand the questions. We can understand that. Sarah sees herself as old and worn out, but God deals with her in kindness. He does not see her that way. You know, sometimes you and I paint a picture of ourselves that's not at all what God sees. We tell ourselves lies and things that are not true And I'm so glad that God sees the truth. He knows exactly about us and he doesn't see us sometimes the way that we see ourselves. So in her denial, she did laugh, but she confirms in that laughter the name of the promised son, Isaac, which means laughter. So look at verse number 16. Then the men set out. Okay, so they're at the tent. They've eaten. Now they're setting out from there and they look down towards Sodom. So They're going down towards Sodom. We know the two angels peel off and they head down towards Sodom. But here the Lord stands with Abraham. And Abraham went with them to set them on the way. He's being a good host still. He's being a good host. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the two angels peel off and head down. Now they're up north. They're looking down southward, a little bit eastward, south and east, and they're looking down towards Sodom, and the angels peel off to head down there. The Lord stands with Abraham right there, and they have a discussion, a discussion. So the duty of circumcision in chapter 16 wasn't the only thing he asked Abraham to do. He wanted him to raise up righteous people, people who love justice and mercy in, their fam- in his family. He was going to be a great nation, so that nation would be a righteous nation. That's God's desire for the nation. He wanted to be a blessing to all the world through Abraham. 
doing what is the right thing. That's what righteousness is, doing the right thing. Proverbs 21 says, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Bringing an offering is not as important to Him as righteousness and justice. Those are more acceptable to Him. That's what He desires. That's what He wanted from Abraham. That's what He wants from His people today as well. So the Lord told Abram of the upcoming judgment against Sodom, and that was to be a warning for all of Abraham's children never to behave like Sodom and Gomorrah. Kyle and Dalich wrote, the destruction of Sodom and the surrounding cities was to be a permanent memorial of the punitive righteousness of God and to keep the fate of the ungodly constantly before the mind of Israel. Don't go and do what they did. And actually later on in the history of Israel, right before the captivity, they're likened to Sodom and Gomorrah. They went there like Sodom and Gomorrah. So Sodom's sins were regarded as great or grave. It's the same word used to describe the intensity of the sin in Noah's day right before the flood. That's how bad Sodom and Gomorrah were. Uh, Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Great, grave, same word. That, the, that, the, that, that, that was the state of Sodom, just like it was before the flood came on the earth. And like the blood of Abel that was spilled by Cain, the un, unpunished sin cries out to heaven for justice, for vengeance. Remember in Genesis 4, the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Yes, the, the voice of, of, of the, the pain that sin causes, crying him out for Sodom and Gomorrah for vengeance. K.A. Matthews wrote, it appears that the sin at Sodom and Gomorrah was social injustice. It was relational. It was things that people did to each other. And the cries were either the result of the victim's pain or their pleas for vengeance. It was bad. It was bad. And God is saying, Abraham, I've given you this land. And part of this land, I'm going to go judge right now because of their state, their sinful state. I'm going to judge them right now. And I'm going to let you know about it because I want to see your compassionate heart for these people. It's exactly what it is. So God says, I'm going to go down and see. Well, can't God see from heaven? Yes, of course. He can see from heaven. But this statement, I will go down to see, does not mean that God did not already know what was happening. This is the language of judgment. When God says, I will go down to see, he's saying, I'm going to go down to judge. He knows exactly what's going on. He sees all things. He knows all things. He knows what is happening. But this is a language of judgment. You see it in Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And then verse 7, come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So let us go down is the idea of judgment. It's a language of judgment. He's going to go down and judge Sodom and Gomorrah. Now he gives Abraham an opportunity, an opportunity to, to, to let us see Abraham's heart. What is Abraham all about? Is he learning from his master? Is he learning to be like his master? What's his heart all about? Look at verses 22. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood still before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the, for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. He's concerned about God's namesake here. The reputation of God. So, so, so far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, let the Lord, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speaking, to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. 
Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak again. But this once, suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. So God had promised Abraham this land and he's telling him what he's going to do in this land down in Sodom and Gomorrah. God is calling Abraham to a deeper walk to reveal what's in his heart, what is in his character. Abraham is later called the friend of God three times specifically in the Bible. In 2 Chronicles, in Isaiah, and in James chapter 2, he's called the friend of God. Here is a man, a human being called the friend of God. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God three times in the Bible. So we're seeing now who this person Abraham was, what kind of character that he had. This is the first time in the Bible that a man initiates a conversation with God. First time. It's never happened before. And usually God is, inter- is starting the conversations. Here, a, a man inter- initiates a conversation. So God is the judge of all the earth. Retribution is an appropriate response to human wickedness. Judgment against sin is the judge of all the earth. That's what he does. He judges sin. Aren't you glad that he judged sin in Jesus Christ for us, that when we believe in Jesus Christ, he will not judge us for our sins, but that he's already judged Christ for his sins? But he has to. It's, it's his character. So Abraham rested his argument on the twin pillars of divine justice and mercy. God, you are just and God, you are merciful. Will you really do this, God? You are just and you are merciful. You are just and you are merciful. He's perplexed that the, that, the, that the righteous would die alongside the wicked because he knows God's character. God, how could you let this happen? He finally gets down to 10. Finally gets down to 10. Probably thinking in his mind, although Lot is not mentioned here, he's probably thinking in his mind, well, there's Lot and his family and at least some of the people that attach themselves to Lot, at least maybe we got 10 and we can save the city. Now, I, I don't want you to forget, God has already described the city. The city is extremely wicked, grave, great sin in the city. Logically speaking, you would say, why would you want to save the city? But he does. He wants to save the city. So he gets down to 10. God himself hinted that Abraham should go no further than 10 and now terminates the conversation. The text says the Lord went his way. He didn't let him go below 10. He stopped at 10. So Abraham, as the prophet, is praying for Sodom and Gomorrah, praying for this wicked place. I mean, you think, the the saying is goes, if if America doesn't change her ways, God's going to be saying sorry to Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at around us in our nation. Sodom and Gomorrah was far worse than our nation, and our nation is bad right now. Abraham is not interceding directly for his people. There's no mention of Lot at all in text. He's thinking, of course, in the back of his mind, 10, yes, but there's no mention of Lot. He's not saying, hey, Lot's down there, God, spare Lot. He didn't even mention Lot at all. Not one thing. But he's interceding interceding for the city of Sodom and the cities of the plain who are extremely wicked before the Lord. People who intercede for others must have compassionate hearts and a deep concern for the salvation of the lost. Here he's saying, yes, they're wicked, Lord, but they're created in your image and likeness. You are a gracious God. Would you spare them, God? Would you redeem them, God? Can you keep them alive, God? You are a compassionate God. Oswald Chambers said to us, God never gives us discernment in order that we may criticize, but that we may intercede. When God gives you an insight into someone's life, it's not to be criticizing them, but it's to pray for them to intercede for them, not to be critical, but to intercede for them and to pray for them. We have been called as a church to to intercede for one another, to pray for one another, to take care of one another. We have been called to do that as a church, to intercede for each other. In Colossians chapter 1, we read this. Paul said, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, to intercede for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding 
so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. And then James 5, 16 says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one, intercede for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. He's asked us to pray for each other, to intercede for one another. We pray for each other. Each of us struggles with our own sins that so easily cling to us. So we pray for each other. Oh God, strengthen them that they don't fall into that sin that they fell into last month, last year. Oh, we all have our own sins that cling to us. Pray for each other. Pray for each other that our relationships blossom and flourish as a church body, that we get to know one another. By the way, to intercede for you means I have to know about you. I know it's not comfortable when I ask or anyone ask, hey, how you doing when you come into church? And we all say, hey, it was great. And you're lying. It was a horrible week. It was terrible. I cannot intercede for you if I don't know where you're at. Even in your bad moments, I need to know where you're at. So pray for each other to be found faithful. Oh yes, at the end, that we have fought the good fight, we have kept the faith, we have been found faithful. Pray for each other for spiritual wisdom and understanding, like Paul told the Colossians, that you would understand more and more about God as you read His Word, you become more and more like His Son, Jesus. And then pray for each other to be comforted in the midst of our sorrows, and there has been a lot of sorrows lately, a lot of sorrows lately. And we need to get around those people who are sorrowing and we need to come by them and hold them and pray for them and intercede for them and stand for them. As they weep, let them weep on our shoulders. They hurt. We hurt with them. We pray for each other. We intercede for each other. It's because we have compassionate hearts for each other. But what about the rest outside the church? How are we supposed to interact with them? Well, Paul told Timothy this in 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge you that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for everyone, for all people, for kings and all who are high in positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. What are we supposed to do for those outside the church? We're to pray for them. We're to intercede for them. I want you to notice that Abraham did not say, Sodom, I know your wicked deeds. You were wicked in the sight of God. You deserve the wrath of God's judgment to fall upon you. May Almighty God strike you down, burn. He didn't say that, did he? Sometimes I feel like John the Apostle, when he and his brother were talking with Jesus and they said, shall we call down fire out of heaven on these people who disregarded you, Jesus? And Jesus said, You don't understand. That's not the spirit. That's not the heart of who we are. We don't do that. But I get it because there are times I look out at my society and I see the wickedness and the evil out there and all I want to say is burn. Burn. I'm tired of all of this. But that's not what God has called us to do. God has called to intercede for those people who are created His image and likeness but do not know Him. Not to say, burn it all down, no, but to say, God, may you come to them, may you open up their understanding, may you call them and save them. We intercede for our leaders. We want righteous leaders who will lead a righteous nation. We pray for people. The tendency is to say, let it burn. No, that's not God's heart. Abraham shows us that's not God's heart. It's a heart of compassion that we want. Instead, Abraham was compassionate on people in Sodom and he wanted God's name to be praised in the judgment that was coming of Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't want God's name stained at all. A compassionate heart interceding not only for one another, but for those outside who do not know God. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the story. Again, it's not a story about hospitality, really. It's not a story about about Sarah. It's, It's a story about you coming to an old woman to give her the faith she needed to conceive the promised son and to reveal your will to Abraham, your servant, your friend, giving him an opportunity to show us his compassionate heart. That's what what these stories are all about. All of these events are lumped together right here to show us your grace and your mercy 
that is extended to us. May we be good interceders for one another. That we can, we can pray for each other. We can encourage one another. But not only that, let's pray for our country, Father. That, that, that we would pray for those in our nation who do not know you. Yes, we get so angry at sin and we want sin to be vindicated and we want the, your wrath to come down on them. But that is not your heart. You sent your son into the world to save sinners of which we are. And there's a lot of them out there, Father. And we pray that you would call and save them too. Bring them into your family as well. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this story and what it means to us. In Jesus' name, amen.